Apparently, my sound has been sorted out. Hello. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Welcome back to the stream. How's everything in chat? Doing good? Very silent. Okay, let's see if we can solve that. Do, 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 do. Audio, sound settings. All right. Master volume. Ouch. No? Audio input capture. Do, do, do. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it's as high as it can go. Let's double now. Yeah, the microphone is as high as it can go. I had this working yesterday. Uh, let's try this. Testing. So is this better? I don't think it is. Uh, because this is actually using the camera microphone. And this is using the actual microphone that I should be using. There we go. Is that better? No, not really. <sighs> Professional streamer, folks. Uh... Yeah, Microsoft always has this problem with microphones that the level is always low. Um, let's see, microphone, level, settings, ah, system, sound, input, so settings, system, sound, input, device properties, aha. There we go. Now it's all the way up. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. Yes, <laughs> it's steam powered. Okay. So yeah, um, the the solution is that there is actually um, a master volume control in uh, in Windows settings. Uh, you have to go to the device properties. Um, why they couldn't just put that on the uh, the main settings panel. I don't know, but anyway, okay, so that has pretty much solved that. Uh, so why Windows then? Because that's what I like. Um, I use Linux at work, um, and everybody's got their own opinion, but I just find that Windows just works with pretty much all the programs that I use. Pretty much flawlessly, with the exception of a few things like, you know, the microphone. These are just little annoyances that I live with. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Uh, yeah, so uh, in yesterday's stream, uh, by the way, the monitor is here and the camera is up there. So, you know, my, my eyes will sometimes look at the monitor instead of the camera. Um, so anyway, uh, in, in the last stream, uh, we looked at some of the NMyGen code for the RISC-V processor that I'm building that isn't going to be on an FPGA. It's going to be built using discrete logic. And we started converting some of the uh, formally verified code uh, to 
using modules that describe the chips that I'm actually using. Uh, and the idea is that I re will replace uh, the, the um, abstract code, uh, the, the abstract logic code with modules that describe the chips little by little and formally verify them uh, all along the way so that I can be certain that when I do translate this to actual chips that it should work. Um, so, yeah, why don't we get started? Uh, last time um, I built a simple multiplexer out of 74 16 244s. Uh, 16244s are 16 bit buffers. So let's take a look at some of the code. Um, so this will look slightly different from uh, yesterday's stream um, because I decided that this looked a lot better than uh, stuffing the choice of whether I'm using chips into decode immediate. Because this is sort of the main function right over here, and I wanted to make it clear uh, what exactly I've moved over to using chips and what I haven't. So, uh, let's see. Uh, and we did go over the decode instruction. There is no, uh, there, there is nothing to convert this to chips because this is just a rewiring of, you know, a renaming of various uh, instruction lines. So we, we did the uh, decode immediate uh, with chips. And if we take a look at that, it will look a little bit different because I did a little bit of cleanup work. Um, I realized that the multiplexer, we're going to be using it all the time. Um, we can take a quick look at KiCad and you can see all of these multiplexers all over the place. So, um, so I decided to make a little module out of it. So if we go there, um, this is the file that I'm keeping all the 16244 based modules in. So um, just to give a review from last time, um, the 16244 uh, is a 16-bit register. It's broken up into uh, four sections of four bits each, and each of those sections has its own independent output enable signal. Um, by the way, on Linux, what software would you use to run this? What is this? Um, I'm using OBS. Uh, to, to stream. Um, I'm using Visual Studio Code as an editor. That's also available on Linux. Um, I'm using NMyGen, which is Python, which is also available on Linux. And the formal verification engine is Yosis, which is also available on Linux. In fact, for all the command line uh, programs, I am using Windows Subsystem for Linux. So. Yeah, the verification. So it, it, it is um, what software? Um, if you take a look at the uh, NMyGen uh, tutorial or the exercises down below in the description, uh, you'll see uh, what software you need to load. So yeah, no worries. Um, so yeah, this is using Python as an HDL. So it's a it's a higher level HDL, uh, also known as a new HDL because it's not Verilog and it's not VHDL. So it's based on Python. Um, again, uh, if you're interested in um, what I'm actually using, it's called NMyGen. Look in the description down below. Do I have a structured course? Kinda, sorta. Um, I have two uh, GitHub repositories. I have NMyGen tutorial and NMyGen exercises. Um, as long as you know Python, I think starting with NMyGen exercises would be great because it takes you from starting with very simple combinatorial circuits all the way up to sequential circuits and formal verification, which is something that I keep you know, banging my shoe on the table about, you should all be using formal verification for your digital circuits. Uh, it's better than unit testing. Okay, so uh, to proceed. So um, the 1640, uh, the 16244 is a 16-bit buffer broken into four sections. Uh, each section I made a little module out of. So I've got A, which is the input, Y, which is the output, and negative output enable. 
uh, which controls the output. So the output is normally zero because again, N my gen does not support high impedance uh, values. The usual way that you do, and the reason that it doesn't is because this is really meant for FPGAs. And inside an FPGA, you don't actually have high impedance signals. The only high impedance signals you have are on the outsides where the pins are. Um, so there's really no reason to support high impedance signals. Um, and the way you the way you handle that typically uh, in in my gen is you just output zeros and then you connect all of the outputs uh, that will feed that bus uh, together uh, by oring them together. So uh, if all of them are outputting zeros, then the bus has zero. Uh, if one of them if one of the outputs is on, then the bus is going to be zero or that output. Um, so you just turn one output at a time on. So that's basically what this does. Um, okay, so then as a cleanup, what I did was I named this buff32, and it's, it's basically a pair of 16244s because I need 32 bits. Um, so 32 bits, so I get two of these. Uh, and then I just wire them up. And this is how you wire them up. And this is one of the advantages of using an HDL based on Python is that you can use Python code in order to generate your, um, your logic. You know, unlike in say Verilog or VHDL where you have to use Verilog or VHDL uh, to generate Verilog or VHDL code. So, you know, Python is a well-known language. So you can, you know, just use Python. Um, okay, so the other thing that I did was I created a module called uh, a MUX32, um, and basically this is just a multiplexer which takes uh, some number of 32-bit inputs and it outputs one of them, depending on the select line that you choose to activate. So um, in normal HDLs, this is what's known as a parameterized module in Python, it's just a function. Um, so uh, what I what I did was, you know, if you want a six input multiplexer, um, you just put six in here. Um, and what this does is it generates an array of six 32-bit inputs. Um, this uh, generates a signal that has n bits, and that's your uh, select signal. And then there's y, which is your output. Um, and to hook it up, basically, I just um, instantiate as many of these 32-bit buffers as I need using Python. That's an array. I add that to the submodules of this module. Um, and then I just hook up the data lines, and I hook up the output enable lines. And to combine it, I just OR the outputs together, which is what I was talking about. Um, so I start with a zero, and then I just OR all of the outputs of the buffers together, and that's what the output of the multiplexer is. So that's the multiplexer, and what it looks like in here is um, I have this gal. Uh, so it's a generic array logic, um, which I'm going to use to generate the select lines out of the opcode. And if you're wondering what that's all about, please watch yesterday's live stream. There, it's a bit involved to go into, but basically it takes the opcode out of the instruction and turns it into the select line for how to decode the immediate value out of the instruction. Um, so I just wire that up to uh, the multiplexer's select lines. Uh, and then I wire up the instruction bits to the multiplexer's inputs. So there's multiplexer 0, multiplexer input 1, input 2, and so on, down to 5. And then, of course, the immediate value is going to be the output of the multiplexer. And that's basically what we did yesterday um, with a little cleanup that I did. So, coffee time. Okay, does someone know if there's something like what nmygen is for HDL but for PCB design to programmatically generate schematics or PCBs? Well, okay, so KiCad's format is based on text, so you can actually write code 
that will generate schematics for you. Um, people have done this as plugins for KiCad um, using Python, um, so it's possible. Um, how do you ensure that you don't introduce any errors when manually transferring your chips code to KiCad schematics? I can't. <laughs> um, I, there was talk a little while ago about wouldn't it be nice to just take the generated output from NMyGen and write some code to generate the schematic? And I'm like, yeah, that's too much work. So, yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so what I wanted to do is uh, go back to where I was here. So this is basically how I switch out whether I'm using the chip version or the abstract logic version. So um, I have this chips parameter, which is the parameter that I use in the sequencer card right here. So if I instantiate the sequencer card with chips set, um, then it'll use the chips version. Otherwise, it'll use the abstract logic version. And again, I can set it, run formal verification, and show that the chip version works uh, just as the abstract uh, logic version works. So the next thing that I'm going to do Let's go down to, yeah, let me show you the, okay. So this is KiCad. Um, it's a pseudo schematic because it, it, it's not really, you know, uh, it can't really be uh, uh, converted into a circuit. It's just a layout of um, what I wrote in NMyGen. So you can see that, that um, there are all these multiplexers over here. Um, there's a bunch of multiplexers here. These are registers up here. Up here are more registers. These are CSRs, even though they're called temp. That's because I forgot to change their name. But, you know, it's basically a whole bunch of multiplexers and registers. And then somewhere in the middle, there's, there's going to be some, you know, logic to actually decode the instruction um, and to, uh, to sequence the instruction, basically. So, you know, there are a lot of these multiplexer modules. What I really want to do is work on these registers over here. So um, if we go back into the code, I can show where we actually do the multiplexing. OK, let's look at some, some of the simple stuff. So this block of code, now if you've watched uh, the previous videos, you'll know that I have an X bus, a Y bus, and a Z bus, and they're both 32, they're all 32 bits. So I have a bunch of essentially selectors for this multiplexer. So I, I basically wrote the abstract logic for a multiplexer and basically said, okay, if the PC to X line is high, then I take the program counter and put it on the X bus. Or if the mem data to X is high, then I take the memory data and put it on the X bus. And if I want to output the value of a control and uh, um, a, a control um, and what, what was S again? Control and system register. Um, you know, like M cause or MEPC or one of those, then I stick that on the output. Otherwise, I don't stick anything on the output. So this is basically a, just a combinatorial multiplexer that does not go to a register. So why don't we replace this? So the first thing that I'm going to do, just to, just to sort of get us in, in the practice of, of doing things. Um, right, status, thank you. Uh, control and status registers. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to move this down to say, I don't know, here. I'm just going to call this um, multiplex x. I'm just going to move the code. OK, so I've moved the code into a function called multiplex x. So now I just need to go back uh, to here and just call it self dot multiplex x m. And then I can just delete this.
Okay, that was nice. Um, so then what I can do is I can create another function that I'm go gonna call multiplex x chips. So if self.chips, self.multiplex x chips, else that. Okay, now I just have to define what multiplex x chips is. So I go to multiplex x, I'm gonna copy it. Gonna call it multiplex x chips. So the way this is gonna work is that I'm gonna implement this using my mux32 um, module. So let's see, how many will I need? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is a nine input multiplexer. Uh, and each of the inputs is 32 bits. So that's like 290, what is it, 296, 294. Um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of lines. But anyway, um, so uh, yeah, if, if we take a look back at KiCad, um, we can see that this is, this down here is really what I'm implementing. And you can see that the multiplexer only has four inputs. And the reason it only has four inputs is that there are these other multiplexers up here, which are the additional seven inputs. So seven, eight, nine input multiplexer. So, you know, I may eventually just make a sort of standard four input multiplexer module. But for now, you know, because I have it parameterized, uh, I'm just going to make it um, a nine input multiplexer. And the way to do that is m dot, so mux equals mux, ic mux 32, nine. That just makes it a nine input multiplexer. So m dot submodules plus equals mux. So now I've added this submodule to this module's submodules. Now all I have to do is wire stuff up. So um, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make um, an array of inputs and I'm just gonna have these things. So this is gonna be input zero. This is gonna be input one. This thing is gonna be input two and so on. Uh, let's see, MEPC. MTVAL, here, let me do this. MTVAL, M status, MIE. Okay, MTVAL, M status, MIE, MIP. Okay, so. Make it look nice. And the enables, or the selectors, selectors are PC to X, memdata to X. Okay, so now we have um, basically some equations to write. So it's gonna be like this this and CSR num equals M cause. Okay, so basically what I did was I, I converted this into um, less abstract logic. So it's just, uh, so this is activated when the CSR num is equal to M cause and we are outputting a CSR to the X bus. So that's the equivalent, right? And then I just need to copy this uh, for all the other ones. Uh, MEPC, MTVAL, MSTATUS, MIE, MIP. So MTVAC, MEPC, MTVAL, MSTATUS, MIE, and MIP. So let's do this. OK, 
Okay, so I should have a total of nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Yep. Okay. So that's nine. So those are my selectors. Let's just do this. Actually, let's make this look nice. Okay. So those are my selectors. So now I don't need this anymore. And now I just need to wire up. Well, let me let me put that back because I do need to remember this thing. So let me hook up the output. So data x out is equal to the output of the multiplexer. So mux dot y. Okay. Now I just need to hook up the inputs and the selectors. And the reason why I put these in arrays is because I can just use the power of Python. The power of Python compels you. For i in range len of inputs, m dot b d dot combinatorial equals mux dot a of i equals inputs of i. Uh, mux dot n select of i equals the negation of selectors, right? Because it's a negative enable. That's it. It's done. Um, so basically, uh, I have converted this multi, oops, I got a, an error. Oops, selectors of i, right? So these are the binary values, um, zeros or ones. Um, which choose which input to uh, select from. Um, yeah, okay. That's a pet peeve of mine. Uh, doing things in a readable, maintainable way or being clever, right? Yes, I can use generators and I can use zip, but honestly, this is just as readable and it's, you know, it, it works. Um, so, you know, that, that's just my opinion, you know, I, I prefer, uh, readability over, you know, knowing, uh, the ins and outs of the language. So enumerate, zip, um, that sort of thing. Um, I, I just, I, I just won't use it, um, because I, I'm not interested in writing compact code. Uh, again, it's the compiler's job to, to figure this out, so... And that's a hill I'm going to die on. OK. Um, what is this complaining about? Consider using <laughs> consider using enumerate instead. No. <laughs> OK. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to do, now that I've converted this over to using the chips, I'm going to formally verify it to make sure that it works. Now, I have to. Um, formally verify this uh, in such a way that um, one of these is actually going to be active. So what I need to do is figure out which instruction uses one of these. Uh, I know the CSRs do, so why don't we just use the CSRs? Um, so I'm going to go to the command line. Okay, and by the way, this was the previous uh, formal verification pass uh, that I did yesterday. Actually, I cleaned it up a little bit. Um, if you see here, you'll see that I've split uh, the fatals into four sections because um, just doing all the fatals all at once, um, well, sequentially, essentially, um, took something like nine minutes. Uh, or, you know, like 12 minutes or something like that. By breaking it up and running them in parallel, um, I'm able to have uh, each section be quicker. And because they run in parallel, the entire thing runs faster. So uh, this is using eight processors, so I was able to uh, formally verify the entire processor in about 12 minutes. Um, so um, one of these is CSRs, right? Yeah, CSR BMC. So all I have to do is do make CSR BMC, 
and I have a make file. And if you look down below, there's a GitHub that I have all this source code in. So you can download it and do it yourself. So let's go ahead and uh, hope this compiles. It compiles, and now we're going to run formal verification. So uh, last night was it 24 minutes? I think it was. I think it was shorter. I think it was on the order of 19 minutes or something. But anyway, um, so while this is ticking away, um, and how long should this take? Let's take a look at CSR. It says 126 seconds right here. So in about uh, two minutes or so, we should get our final answer. Um, so we will check on that in a moment. Going back to KiCad. So the other thing, so that, that takes care of this, um, get my cursor right. So that takes care of, where is my cursor? Where is my cursor? Here's my cursor. What CPU do you have? I don't know. Um, it's, it's, just a, it's just a processor. I mean, they've all got multiple cores nowadays. So um, I think mine has 16 cores. Um, you want to know the exact thing? OK. Uh, what is it? Windows? No, it's system information. System information. It is an Intel Core i9. 9900K CPU running at 3.6 gigahertz. So that's my gaming system. Um, and I have, uh, like I said, 16 cores, which you can verify by going to the command line and using Windows subsystem for Linux. So let's do that. Okay. All right, you know how many characters my password has. Um, what is it? Cat proc CPU info. Yeah, 16. So there's 16 processors. Um, I don't know if it's like eight real cores and um, each one of those has two virtual cores. There was that game that they were playing for a little while. Anyway, ah, look at that. Okay, it succeeded. So, you know, this, this basically checked that at least the multiplexing of the CSR outputs worked. Um, yeah, that's right, eight cores and 16 threads. But, you know, this is actually calling them processors. So, you know, I, I don't know if this is cores and threads combined together or whatever. I don't know. Personally, I don't care. I'm not really interested in those numbers. Um, okay. Um, would the latest AMDs make this stuff much faster? Well, I don't know. Um, and again, I... I really don't care. As long as it can play games, <laughs> I'm fine with that. And as long as it has enough processors and, and, and memory to do what I need it to do, I'm fine with this. You know, I don't, I don't like do ray tracing and, you know, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, this passed. It took 148 seconds. Excellent. Uh, LSCPU. Let's try it. Um, let's do LSCPU. LSCPU. That's neat. It says 16 CPUs, threads per core, two, cores per socket, eight. Yep, there you go. Okay. Um, yeah, I know the, the M1s apparently now have phenomenal performance, finally. Um, Still is not going to persuade me to go back to Mac OS. Um, I, I used Mac OS for, I don't know, probably about five years, um, ever since the, the G3 came out, or made, no, I think the, G, the G5. the um, G And I stuck with Mac laptops, and I, I just got kind of tired of, A, not being able to play, you know, the, the typical games on it, and B, um, you know, the, the tech refreshes just didn't really give you all that much additional boost. Um, so, 
Yeah, um, eventually I just decided to go to Windows. And at the time it was Windows 7, um, which I was sort of okay with. Um, but then Windows 10 came out and uh, I was actually kind of blown away by the improvements that they made with Windows 10. I mean, Windows 10 is not the Windows of 10 years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they did a really good job. Uh, I have to hand it to Microsoft, so. Okay, um, so uh, the CSR checking passed. Um, I'm pretty sure that all the other checking will pass too, but let's just, let's just do our due diligence and go to uh, the code again. And, uh, okay, so there's this uh, PC to X. So where did I use that? Copy, find. I used it in the AUI PC instruction, okay. And where did I use memdata? Memdata to X. I used it in load. Did I use it anywhere else? No, I just used it in load. Okay, so so if I just um, verify one of the load instructions and AUIPC, that should be sufficient. So let's go back to the command line. Let's go ahead and make time make minus J2 um, AUIPC BMC and I don't know, LB, uh, LW, BMC, load word. I think that should be short, relatively short. Um, yeah, this should probably finish in about 30 seconds or so. So here it is, it's checking stuff, it's making sure that all the assertions that I wrote work. Okay, there's one of them that passed, that was AUIPC. It's a really quick one. LW takes a little while longer to verify because um, instead of six machine cycles, it runs in 18 machine cycles, which is three instruction cycles. Um, yeah, gaming answers the question of why Windows. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, really I wanted an all-around machine because I do both software development and uh, I like to play games. Um, I'm not a gamer. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I did not buy Cyberpunk 2077. Um, so, yeah, I just like the games that I like. Um, so, okay, this is, it's taking a little longer than I thought it would. Um, let me go back to the listing LB, well, it said, oh, wait, where's LW? Oh, 268, okay, well, that's going to be like five minutes, so, okay, maybe not. Um, it took 74 seconds. Um, yeah, so that's, that's weird. Um, I suspect that there's like some threading issue where, if I run uh, all of the, well, if I run eight of the um, uh, things simultaneously, um, they sort of get in each other's way somehow, but anyway. Um, yeah, so Cyberpunk 2077. I mean, I, I, I do kind of want to play it. It's not really my kind of game, but I, I do kind of like the idea of having a large world to explore. Um, I do like that. Um, that's why I bought Elder Scrolls um, because it was it's a pretty huge world and I just liked running around in the world and, and doing quests. Um, you know, really the games that I like are the crafting type games. So I really like No Man's Sky and I bought it when it first came out and I lived through the disappointment and, and they really came through. So, um, so yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure that you know, Project uh, Project Red or whatever they're called, Project Wrecked, because I'm sure the developers are wrecked. Um, will will get their act together and and fix it. Um, one thing that I like about No Man's Sky is I I don't think they force the developers into crunch. Um, yeah, No Man's Sky has really improved. I mean, it's it's really it's beautiful. Um, so anyway, okay, enough about that. Um, we're here to talk about um, digital logic. All right, 
So what we've done is we've just um, converted one of these multiplexers, this cool multiplexer, combinatorial multiplexer, where is it, right here, into the chip version, and it works great. We could do the same with the others, but I can do that, you know, on our off time. You don't have to live through it. So the interesting thing that I wanted to really talk about is this section of code. So this is a multiplexer, but it's got a register on the end, and that's what uh, that's what this thing over here is. So instead of m.d.comb, which is the combinatorial domain, that's a clock domain, but it's you know it's the unclocked combinatorial domain. This is a domain where all the signals change on PH2W. So if we go up to the um, crazy ASCII diagram that I wrote, um, so this is an instruction cycle. It's basically six uh, system clock cycles. And typically on the first three, I'm doing a read, and on the second three, I'm doing a write. And within read, basically I've got setup, read, and latch, and I've got setup, write, and hold. Um, do I have a check to ensure only one multiplexer input is, uh, I think you mean activated? Um, formal verification would have checked that, right? Because if more than two uh, multiplexer inputs were selected, then the output would not be the correct input. And the way that formal verification works is that it looks for, it specifically looks for when the outputs are not as expected. So it would rapidly show you uh, a, a trace um, that tells you what went wrong. Well, I mean, it doesn't tell you what went wrong. It'll just show you the signals, and then it's up to you to figure out what went wrong. But it'll say, oh, this assertion failed. And typically, it'll be something like, you know, this instruction failed. So, I mean, if you want, we can look at um, verify a a u i p c a u i find a u i p c. Um, and this is the assertion. These are the assertions for verifying the AUIPC instruction. So obviously, the the program counter had had to be incremented by four. We make sure that happens. We make sure that all the registers are the same except for the destination register. And if the destination register is not zero, we make sure that the destination register was loaded with the correct result. So if something went wrong, this is not going to work. Um, yeah, those two phi signals are all that is needed. Um, not quite. Because I have this other signal here, which is just uh, the phase two write pulses. So, and on the positive edge, that's where I'm writing the CSRs. So if we go back down to the code, this is the CSR writing code. So um, it starts off with, um, if the signal to write whatever's on the Z bus to the CSR is high, and the CSR number is one of these CSRs, then on the positive edge of phase two write, I write whatever is on the Z bus into the appropriate register. It's a little bit more complicated with the MIP register. This is the machine interrupts pending register um, because you're not allowed to write to the pending bits. Uh, you're allowed to write to all the other bits. You, you just are not allowed to write to pending um, because when, you know, when, when an interrupt goes up, um, you need to make sure that it gets pended um, and you don't want the, you know, you don't want software messing that up. So, uh, so anyway, that's that. Um, so yeah, okay, so here's what I wanted to do. So let's go to the whiteboard. Okay, whiteboard. All right, so in NMyGen, when you have a register, so let's have this as a register, and it's a 
D register with a Q output and a clock. Okay, so there's the input, D, there's the output, Q, and there's the clock, which is positive edge triggered. You can set up the clock domain so that it's actually negative edge triggered, but you know, whatever. Say it's positive edge triggered. So, you know, if you have code like uh, m dot d dot, um, let's just say ph1 plus equals, you know, q dot equals five, let's say five. Uh, well, okay, let's just say a. So let's suppose you have this signal a. Um, and what this does is on the positive edge, uh, on the positive edge of the clock, it loads uh, the register with A. But what happens if there's an if in there? So something like this, with m dot if load. So now it's basically conditionally loading A into the register. And what happens if load is not high? Well, the register should retain its value. It doesn't get zero, it retains its value. So in terms of the actual implementation, what does this look like? So if this is your register and this is your clock, here's data and here's Q, what this actually looks like is there's an implicit multiplexer in front of this. One of the signals is the actual output. The other signal would be A. And basically, this is your load signal, where if load is 1, you load A into the register. But if none of these conditions is true, then the register retains its value. And the reason that you do this, again, is because of FPGAs. In FPGAs, the clocks typically uh, are strongly buffered. They go, they, they spread themselves out throughout the FPGA chip. And remember, you know, these clocks can feed thousands upon thousands of, of flip-flops. Um, the last thing you want to do in an FPGA is take a clock signal, apply logic to it, and then apply the output of that logic to the clock of a flip-flop. Um, because that results in delays, um, it results in glitches, um, and also um, because you're using the output of logic rather than the output of a clock buffer, um, you know, your, your FPGA may not even work um, because, uh, because, um, because you have too many flip-flops connected to that signal. So that's why typically in an FPGA, you don't apply logic to clocks. You simply have the clock clocking every register. Um, and that's why this is the implementation that you use to basically be safe. Now, that being said, we're not doing this in an FPGA. So this is the safe route. The non-safe route, and you'll see in a moment why I'm calling it non-safe, is to take your register, here's D, here's A, your input, and here's your clock. Okay, so the idea is that here's your clock, it's clocking away, and your load signal is going to be high, say here. Okay, so if you and the two together, you end up with something like this which looks great. We can just stick that into the clock and we're done. So, you know, let's suppose this is load and this is clock. Well, you know, let's just stick an AND gate in here, load and clock. Okay, but there's a, a slight problem with this. Um, and the problem is, first of all, what happens if the load signal is actually generated as a result of that clock? In other words, the clock causes a load signal to happen. So you might get something like this, right? Because all of your logic is clocked um, and there's a glitch right over here. 
So your load signal will actually look like this. That's no good for anyone. So that's what I meant by, you know, glitching. Um, so there's a real danger uh, in, in doing that sort of thing. Now, if you can guarantee, if you can guarantee that, let's suppose here's the edge that we want to load on. If you can guarantee that the load signal changes just before that edge and also changes on the following edge or doesn't change on the pre or or changes after the previous edge and and before the next two edges something like that uh, then you can use this sort of signal but um, it's dangerous and you have to be really careful so that's why when I'm going to create a registered multiplexer from NMyGen code, I'm going to be using the safe route. Yes, it may require more chips because, you know, let's suppose this was the only thing that I had. Um, instead of just having a register and an AND gate, well, now I have a register and a multiplexer. And uh, a 32-bit multiplexer is two chips. This is a two-input multiplexer, so that's four additional uh, four additional 16-bit chips, um, as opposed to just a single AND gate. So, but I'm going to live with it, because again, it's it's the safe route, and I really don't want to screw this up. The last thing I want to do is respin PCBs, and that, that's why I abandoned the initial effort that I that I did two years ago. So, um, okay. So let's go back to the coding. So with that in mind. Uh, we now know what we need for this. Essentially, what I want to do is add a with else m.d.ph2w plus equals self.state. Oh, wait a minute. That's not right. Uh, yeah, this, this logic is sort of, uh, I need to sort of pull some of this logic out. But basically, um, what I need to do is make sure that. Um, Okay, by default, I'm allowed to do this because in nmygen, if you have two statements that write the same signal, it's the second statement that takes precedence. So I'm allowed to do this, right? mcause is just loaded with mcause unless this logic is activated, in which case Z goes into M cause. Okay, so um, can that unsafe route be formally verified and checked if it has problems on clock edges? Not really, um, because uh, because then you would have to simulate timing. Um, and now you're slicing your clock into subclocks, and that's not something that I want to do. I, I just will try to be cognizant of um, of timing issues and things like that, and I will basically do the safe thing. Okay, uh, yeah, try not load or clock, and I won't have a rising edge. That's right. For certain for certain values of load, for certain waveforms of load. For other waveforms, that's not going to work. So for every signal that I have, I'm going to have to analyze it to make sure that it's the right kind of waveform and I use the right kind of logic for that waveform. Um, so it depends on you know when that enable signal goes high and when it goes low. And again, I, I just don't want to do that. Um, OK, I need to take a quick bio break. So uh, I'm going to turn the music on again. Um, I hope you stick around. Um, just taking a short break. I will be right back.
Okay, and we are back. Hello again. Okay. Um, so, I guess what I'm going to be doing is um, for each of these registers, the idea is that I'm going to have the register and the multiplexer for it. And the multiplexer is either going to take uh, the output of the register as the input, um, and the other input is going to be this thing, data z in. So let's take a look at a typical register. So the registers that I want to use, let's go to uh, Chrome. Here's a data sheet. Okay, this is the 16374. It's basically a regular 374, except it's got 16 bits. Um, it's actually two 8-bit registers, or one 16-bit register if you connect the, the clocks and the output enables together. Uh, yes, it has an output enable. No, I can't actually use that because, well, uh, reasons. Um, typically, the outputs of registers in my system don't go to buses. They, they go elsewhere. Um, and not only that, but the outputs need to feed back to the input, so I have to enable the output all the time. So anyway, that's what that looks like. Um, yeah, there's, there's this thing over here, which initially fooled me because I'm like, well, that means that it's, uh, it's clocked on the negative edge, but you know, there's this other inverter, so it's actually clocked on the positive edge. Uh, and in fact, um, if we look down here at the function table, we can see, um, we can see that it's clocked on the positive edge. So, yay. So uh, that's the chip that I want to use. And so, and so we go back to coding. Um, yes, that's right. There is a Docker image. So if you go to the, uh, if you go down in the description, if you go to the NMyGen exercises, um, the uh, introduction to that shows how to get the Docker image. And I highly recommend that because it basically has everything that you need. So, yeah. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and create the 16... 374 in nmygen. So I'll start. I'll start by copying uh, just a typical small module, and I'll save this as seven uh, IC seven four one six three seven four. Okay, seven four one six three seven four sixteen bit registers. Okay. Um seven four one six three seven four three seven four sixteen bit register. Okay. Um, so because I don't have any 8-bit registers, um, I'm just going to treat this as a single 16-bit register. So um, D is 16 bits. There is a negative output enable signal, which um, I'm going to keep. The output is 16. And there is also a clock. Um, so what I want to say is clock is a signal. Uh, is it a signal? I'll figure that out in a moment. OK. Uh, so the reason, the reason for that is this. Implement the logic of the register. So it's going to be m. Uh, let's see, reg equals no. self, 
So it's m dot d dot something, right? This would this is normally where I would put the um, the uh, the uh, clock domain. Like for example, it could be pH one, or it could be pH two, or it could be pH two w. So something's going to go there. Plus equals self dot q equals actually it's because there's a negative output. Really, it's going to be self uh, underscore q. This is sort of this is sort of the the internal version. So that's this equals d, and then um, self dot q equals zero. And then this is just like the multiplexer with m dot if self dot n o e not then self dot q equals self dot underscore q. That's the internal version. What are you using for type annotation support with nmygen? Well, specifically with nmygen, nothing. Um, I'm just using Python's typing hints. So, um, so for example, platform, that, that's just what goes there. Um, so, all right, so what actually goes in here? Uh, well, I have this uh, clock thing, so I'm just set, going to say self.clock equals clock, so I have it. And I'm going to say that when I use this, I'll just say clock equals m dot d dot whatever it is, right? So that when the logic gets created, it's just, you know, whatever domain I choose to put in there, okay? That's the 16374. Okay, now uh, what I want to do is create a bunch of utility logic. So one thing that I'm going to want to create is a reg32, which is just going to be a pair of those things. So a 32-bit register from a pair of 16-bit registers. So I need an init. And then I'm going to say self.d equals signal 16, 32. Self.negative output enable is a signal. Self.q equals signal 32, d and q. And in the elaborate function, let me just copy that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say regs equals, and then two of those. Um, I see this, and oh yeah, and I need to give it the clock domain that it should clock on. Clock. And then m dot submodules plus equals reg, regs, okay. And then I'm going to feed the first 16 bits into the first register and the second 16 bits into the second register. So for i in range two, combinatorically regs of zero sub sure noe equals self dot noe. I need to tie the output enables together. Uh, this is i. Regis sub i dot uh, d equals self dot d. So it's going to be i times 16 to i times 16 plus 16. So that's that 16-bit section. Um, and then for the output, self.q of i times 16 to i times 16 plus 16 equals regs of i dot q. Okay, what's it complaining about? Clock, that's right. Self.clock equals clock. Self.clock. Self clock. Okay, so that's my 32-bit register. 
Now, if we go back to the sequencer card here, we can see that the M cause register gets loaded with the Z bus if some condition is true. Otherwise, it retains its value. So that seems like a useful module because if you look, it, it's basically all of these are like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make another utility called um, reg32, <laughs> a retaining reg32, I guess. Um, so elaboratable, a 32-bit register. Actually, you know what? I'm going to call this reg32 with load that loads or retains its value. Okay. So it's going to be this. And I'm going to have an additional signal called load. So if load goes high, we're going to load D to Q. Otherwise, we're going to retain the value. Um, right, so I need the elaborate. OK, implements the logic of the register. So let's just strip this out. And we'll just say reg equals a reg32. And we need to give it the clock, self.clock. OK, so how is this going to work? Well, first of all, we need to route D and NOE. Um, let's route NO, uh, NOE first. So m.d.combinatorically dot dot combinatorically reg dot n o e equals self dot n o e all right that that just gives us an output enable isn't that a d flip-flop with enable um yes and in fact if we were putting this in an fpga we would use a d flip-flop with enable um we're not putting this in an fpga we we have to build this ourselves um so yeah um, and I don't know if you were here for the, uh, you know, like half an hour ago, but we sort of discussed um, what's wrong with, uh, with gating the clock signal using an enable signal. Um, it's just, you just have to be really careful. And I, I don't want to be really careful. I just want to be safe. Um, so let's see. So what we want is um, a multiplexer. Yeah, we're going to need a multiplexer mux equals ic mux 32. Um, and there are two inputs. So what I need to do is import from ic this import ic mux 32. OK, so there's my two input multiplexer. So uh, I need to add the submodules, m.submodules plus equals reg and mux. OK, so now let's hook up the multiplexer. So the multiplexer gets two inputs. It gets D and it gets the output. So m.d.com plus equals mux.a sub 0 equals um, this is going to be self.q, and the other input is going to be d. Okay. The multiplexer's selection signal. Okay, so when is q going to be selected? And remember, this is negative select. So q is going to be selected if load, so first let me do this in positive logic. 
Okay, so when load is not true, then we want the input to be the output. And because this is a negative select, we just do that. And that means that the other one has to be the opposite. Okay, and finally, where does the output go to? m.b.com plus equals reg.d equals mux dot y. y is the output. This is self dot load. Self dot load. Okay, so we've got our multiplexer inputs, Q and D. We've got our multiplexer selections. We've got the input to the register, which is going to be either Q or D, and the output, self.q equals reg.q. Yeah, okay, so the Docker stuff. Um, you don't have to build it. Uh, you can just download it if, if there is a build for it. Um, if you want to build it, great, but I believe there is a downloadable version. Okay, so is this right? Uh, did I do this right? So I've got the negative output enable, right? I've got the multiplexer. I've got the multiplexer's output going to the register's input and I've got the register's output going to our output. And of course, um, this doesn't have to be self.q, this can be reg.q. Yeah, I think that's what I want. Yeah, that's definitely what I want. Okay, um, how about we write some formal verification code for this? I mean, I could just throw it in there and see if it works. Let's just write some formal verification code for this. I mean, it's, it's probably not that difficult. So let me grab my formal verification skeleton. Turn M and something, and then I need a main method. Here's my main method. Better save that. Main method. So this is going to be I see reg thirty two with load. Okay, so. So there's a typical way to do this. And what I'm going to do is load up that typical way by going to the nmygen exercises. And you'll learn about this in the nmygen exercises. I'm just going to grab that. So the idea here is that um, sync is the default clock domain. Um, and without, well, let me just copy this uh, file before I forget. Okay. So sync, sync is the default clock domain, so I'm just pulling the clock and reset uh, uh, lines out of it. Um, and then I'm going to write an assumption that says the clock has to clock. It has to go up and down and up and down on every time step. So. That's really what I'm doing here. Also, I'm going to assume that I'm not you know, resetting anything. Because again, in FPGAs, um, when you set up a flip-flop, all the clocks are connected, and you can also connect all the reset signals as well. Um, and here, I don't have any reset logic, so. Okay. 
Okay, so that's that's my setup. Um, I'm going to need, uh, let's see, clock signal and reset signal. So clock signal and reset signal. And I'm going to need assume and past. Don't need that anymore. Okay, so what do we want to make sure of? Well, we want to make sure that, let's see. Um, if s.load is not true, if, if the past of that is not true. So in other words, let me, let me go to the, uh, to the drawing board so I can show you what I'm, what I'm thinking. All right, so here's our clock. And we know that things are going to get uh, loaded on the positive edge, right? And here is our sync. I think it's like that. I might be wrong. I'll correct it later. Um, it, it just might be that this is time step 0, time step 1, time step 2, or it could be time step, I think it's this. Right, because of that assumption that the clock signal has to be the opposite of what it was in the past by one time step. So, um, so actually, let me do this: zero, one, two, three, four. So those are the formal verification time steps. Okay. So what I really want to make sure is that if load was high, so during this time step. Uh, here's my register. So this is uh, okay. Let's let's deal with the case where load is low, right? So I don't want the register value to change, right? Whatever this is is whatever this was. So the way to say that is that on this time step, we want to make sure that Q just let's call that the register's output, is equal to the past of Q, right? That's the past of Q right over here. And I want to make sure that that's true when the load signal is low. OK, so I can write that down. Coding. So. Um, and of course, it's going to be the past of load because I'm going to go back to the whiteboard because it's the value right over here that actually matters um, because that's when the positive edge happens. So coding. Um, <clears throat> then assert that uh, s.q uh, is equal to past of s.q. So that's how I write that assertion. Um, the other thing is I just want to make sure negative output works. So with m dot if um, s dot negative output is disabled, assert that s dot q equals zero. Okay. The signals that I'm giving formal verification to play with are negative output enable and load, and there's also a D in there, right? So if in the past load was true, then assert that Q is equal to D from the past. In other words, that it loaded. Tilde, tilde is invert. So, you know, in, in normal logic, it would be, you know, bang, or in Python it would be not. These are uh, signals, so it's a tilde, which, is, which means invert, bitwise invert. OK. OK, so I might run into trouble here because if past s load and we had a positive edge. Rows 
sync clock. I'm going to move this up to here. Okay, I need rows. And rows is just shorthand for it's now one, but in the past it was in, in, one time step before it was zero. In other words, it went from zero to one. In other words, the signal rose. So if uh, in the past, just before the negative edge, load was high and we get a positive edge, then we want to make sure that whatever D was, it's loaded into Q. And that it is now, and that Q is now what D was one step in the past, which is when load was was asserted. Okay. Um, but of course, if if load is not there, then uh, we want to assert that uh, the value is retained. In fact, let's also do with M if uh, fell sync clock. Right. That's the negative edge. Obviously, it's going to be retained. And now I'm going to need fell. Bell. So, all right, we've got pretty much, yeah, pretty much this is this is a description of, of the way it's supposed to work. Um, and what formal verification is going to do is it's going to take all of these input signals and it's going to play with them in order to try to violate these assertions. Shall we try it? All right, so let me go to ICs and let's see, ICs, not dot pi, ICs dot SBY. So this is my formal verification setup thing. I'm going to run BMC for 10 time cycles just for fun. Okay, just to make sure that none of the assertions ever get violated for 10 formal verification cycles, which would be five cycles of the clock. Because remember, on every formal verification cycle, we want to invert the clock. So clock, 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 clock. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and run this. Command line. Where is my command line? Python three I see seven four one six three seven four dot pi generate. I have an error. Oh yeah, right, clock. I forgot about that. Um, so when I create this I have to say this is equal to m dot d dot sync. Okay. I hope I hope that's right. Uh, here, let me. So that's what I changed. So I, I need to give it the clock domain. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's correct, and I'm pretty sure that's going to work. If it doesn't, I'm going to have to think of something else to do. But let's see if it compiles. Oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, yeah, right. I used the wrong equals uh, coding. I want to assert that s.q equals zeros. These should all be equals. These are conditions, not statements. Meh. There we go. Okay, uh, let's try it again. Command line, run. Hey, compiled. All right, that's one. Sby ICs dot uh, sby. So, so um, what what Jen does here? Um, I've I've set this up so that um, when I run one of these files, it compiles it into top level dot il. Il stands for intermediate language. Um, and that's the, the language that Yosis can input to do its formal verification. And what ICs.SBY does is it reads in uh, toplevel.il and uh, it runs formal verification on it, specifically BMC. So let's see what happens. Fail! 
Can I get some Fs in the chat? Can I get some Fs in the chat? All right. So the assertion that it's complaining about is on line 110. So let's take a look at line 110. Oh, and whenever whenever uh, the, the model fails, you get a trace that you can look at. Thank you, chat. I appreciate your, your, your sympathy. <laughs> OK, uh, 110. OK, so this is what went wrong. So apparently, uh, load was high in the past, and the clock rose, and yet the output was not equal to the pass of the input. Let's take a look at the trace and find out why. So let's go to the command line, and I will grab this, gtk wave minus f, that. And let's take a look at GTK wave. All right. So here's the top, and we can see a whole bunch of signals. Um, does clock give me anything? Yeah, that's my clock signal, I guess. There's my load signal. Uh, there's negative output enable, which is zero. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, reset was low. That's also good. So let me just delete that signal because we know. Okay, chat is guessing. Uh, does S of D go to S of Q? Well, we'll see. So here's Q. Uh, where is... Where's S? Oh, here's D. Uh -huh. Okay, so what formal verification decided to do was on this clock cycle, now remember, here's the positive edge right over here. So what we want is for this value to get transferred into Q. Let's take a look at Q. So this is the, uh, okay, so these two here are the internal uh, values of that, that internal Q. Uh, and I think this one is the correct output. All right. So as you can see, the value did not get transferred. Let's take a look at these intermediate values. Aha, uh -huh, the intermediate values didn't even get transferred. How about the Ds? Okay, so there's the input of uh, the 16-bit multiplexer and the output didn't change. So let's see if we can figure out where I screwed up. All right, let's go over the logic again here. Okay. Um, yep, here is the problem. I shot myself in the foot. Um, self dot clock plus equals. I created a statement, but I didn't say what clock domain that statement should happen in. So uh, these are, this is a typical foot gun that you run into with nmygen, is you create a statement and then neglect to assign it to a, a domain. I'm pretty sure that there is an outstanding feature request for preventing foot guns like this. Um, there's another foot gun, which is really interesting to see. Um, when is self underbar Q set? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, yeah, you're right. You're right. So this should be this should be m dot d dot combinatorial. So Q always gets the output from here. Is that is that the mistake that I made? Is that the mistake that I made? Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. I never assigned the output in the combinatorial domain. I, I just forgot that. And also, I forgot that here too. Right. So like I said, um, that's one of the foot guns. Um, the other foot gun, let me just make sure I didn't make that mistake elsewhere. 
Bitly.com plus equals plus equals. Yeah, okay. So this is looking good. Okay. The other foot gun is something like this. Let's suppose you have this 16-bit signal self.d, right? And let's suppose you want to do something like this. If self.d is equal to 1 or self.d is equal to 2, then, you know, do something. Well, first of all, this is m dot, m dot if, right? Okay. So that's your logic. Well, this does not do what you think it does because, in fact, uh, or, this is bitwise or, right? Because this is now uh, signal logic and not uh, Python logic. This is not valid, and there are technical reasons why you can't do this. So you have to use bitwise or. And then the problem is that bitwise or is higher precedence than equals. So what you're actually doing is you're comparing dot D to one or self dot D, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So that's one of the other foot guns. So you always have to be careful to surround your comparisons with parentheses. Okay, so there's this comment about line 110. Uh, no, this is just a comparison. What a terrible DSL. Thank you. Um, you get used to it. Um, that's all I can say. You get used to it. And, you know, we're working within the Python language, and there are certain restrictions that come with that. All right, so let's go ahead and try this again. Let's go to the command line. Let's go ahead and recompile. Let's go ahead and... Ah, uh, we failed again. All right, 113. What's wrong with 113? Mm-hmm. If the sync clock fell, then assert that the output is equal to the past of Q. Okay, so what, what happened there? Let's go ahead and check the trace. And let's go to GTK wave. And let's open up the clock. And let's take a look at the output. Where is the output? I think that's the output. Oh, that's weird. Hmm. What happened here? Uh, what's D? D. Okay, somehow... Somehow, somehow this got loaded on the negative edge of clock. And I think what's going on is, let me just, let me just check something really quickly. Sync clock and sync reset. Okay. Okay, here are the individual parts. And here is Q1 next. Somehow Q1 next ran into this. Okay. I'm very puzzled. I'm very puzzled. I wonder if I got the domain wrong? No. I wonder if Okay. 
Okay. Also, I, I just want to point out that that NMyGen is still under development. So there are some issues. All right. I think what I need to do is this. I, and I hate having to do this, but okay. I'm going to just say clock equals clock domain. CLK M dot domains plus equals clock. I'm going to create a new clock domain that isn't that um, that looks like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it clock. So M dot D dot sync plus equals clock equals not clock. I'm going to make it clock. Because I think what's actually happening here is that sync is now actually um, the formal verification clock. And it doesn't, ex and, it, and it, it acts as though it is a positive edge on every clock. So it's like it doesn't have negative edges. It only has positive edges. So um, I think what I need to do is change all these things to clock. I need to in include clock domain. And I know this is confusing, but yeah, it, it actually is confusing. Uh, clock. Okay, now I need a clock. I need the clock signal of this. So uh, let me just call this pH. I hate having to do this, but clock equals clock signal of pH. I really hate having to do this, but. Um, And then uh, m dot m dot d dot ph. Okay. So what's happening is that sync, you can think of this as um, all positive edges. So there's only a positive edge happening. Uh, let me draw this out. So I had this diagram here, and I thought that this was what sync would end up looking like. But in fact, what I think it looks like is this. And what I really want is my pH clock to do this. So, um, so that's really what I'm trying to get to work. Uh, so let's go back to coding. Let's take a look at that. I think that is correct. So let's go to the command line and try to Compile, run. Can I get some more Fs in the chat, please? This is this is the most frustrating part of using nmygen with formal verification. Okay. Uh, so line one sixteen. L let's just take a look at the. the trace top. Okay, here is pH. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so it said uh, 116. Let me just quickly look at 116. All right, so it's claiming that D did not get loaded. Um, so there is D in the past, and what's Q? Where's Q? 
zero. Oh, we, we don't see GTK wave. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. There's GTK wave. All right. So, all right. So what's happening is um, D, there, there's the positive edge. Here's D in the past, and here's Q now. And it's showing up as zero. So again, let me take a look at the individual pieces. So here is... Okay, so there's that individual piece, and it didn't get loaded. So let's take a look at the code. So this is where I basically just stare at this for a little while and try to figure out exactly what's going wrong. Maybe I should just formally verify this module first, because that seems to be the source of a lot of the issues. So. I'm going to do that. So I'll keep my clock. So I'm going to just formally verify that module. So let's go ahead and copy this thing down here. Okay. So I'm going to keep all this garbage about the clock. And I'm going to say that we're going to test this thing. Okay. Um, I'm going to just move this down here. Okay, so if not output enable, then we want to make sure that Q is equal to zero. Now we don't have a load. So what I want to make sure is that if in the past, so if the clock rose, then we want to assert that s.q yeah also if negative output enable i wonder if that's the mistake that i made and if fell clock and there okay so if the output is enabled um, and the clock rose, then I want to make sure that D got loaded into Q. Uh, if the output is enabled and the clock fell, then I want to make sure that um, we retain the value of Q. So let's go here, just so that we have Q, and let's go ahead and formally verify that. So, command line. Oh. And I need to go back to the code. And for main, I want to run this module. Yeah, I already did that. OK, good. So command line. Code generates. OK, so we got a failure. So let's see why. In line 57. So let me go to the code and take a look at line 57, see what it's complaining about. Okay, it's complaining that something didn't load. So let's go to GTK wave, top. It's kind of embarrassing that like the simplest thing I couldn't get right. Okay, negative output enable is low, which means that the output is enabling. Just make sure. Oh, wait, reset was high. Oh, I don't want that. No, no, I don't want the reset line to be high because then it's going to clear out all of the, uh, it's going to clear out all of the registers. So let me just m.d.com assume reset signal for pH 
equals zero. Um, let me just use tilde. Maybe that's what went wrong. Maybe. Okay, now we've got a failure in line 60. Coding. Thought this was going to be easy. All right, 60. Okay, so now we're asserting that... So now it didn't retain its value when the clock fell. That's not good. That's not good at all. So let's see why. There's our clock, there's our reset, that's nice. Here is negative output enable. Okay, uh, oh, <laughs> yes, so the past of Q is gonna be disabled, which means it would be zero, so of course. All right, I've gotta change my conditions. And the past and the past of negative output enable is enabled. Okay, right? Because I'm looking at the past of the output. And of course, if the past, if the past of if the output was disabled in the past, yeah. All right. Uh, run it again. Hey, <laughs> okay. So, with all that, let's see if we can transfer that knowledge over. So, because it, it seems like, you know, the only mistakes I made was, was uh, you know, aside from this maybe clock domain thing, um, the conditions. So, let's go ahead here. Yeah, see, I made the same mistake over here. So I want to make sure that if um, I want to make sure that the output is enabled, you know what? So first of all, with m dot if uh, else there, okay. So if the output is disabled, then I want to assert this. Otherwise, if the output is enabled, then first of all, if the past um, of the output is enabled and we weren't loading, then we want to make sure that, that we retain the value. Um, let's see. This I don't need to change because we're just looking at D, which is an input, not an output. So I don't care about negative output enabled. Um, here, however, I'm looking at the past of Q. So yeah, is it worth trying without the domain? Yeah, maybe. It's possible. Let's try this. Let's just try this and see if it works. Oh, I need to change the, uh, the main again back to the big one. Okay. Uh, why don't I test? Oh yeah, right. I forgot that too. Thank you. M dot D dot com plus equals assume that we are not resetting because our chip doesn't have a reset. So not reset signal of pH pH, which is our main clock. Okay. So, um, Command line. Nice. Can I get some GGs in the chat? All right. Um, 
So let's go ahead and try this without that ridiculous clock. So let's just do this. Sync. And let's see, rows, sync clock, fell sync clock, and then we don't need this. Okay, so if, if that screws up, I can always, I can always back out. Um, so let me just make sure that I got all of the things that I need. Yes, okay, let's go to the command line and let's go and yeah, okay, I, I needed the clock, so, oh well. Yeah, I needed that silly, silly, silly thing, which I really hate, but what can you do? Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so I had to uh, revert all that stuff. Oh, well, um, command line, double check that it works. Yeah, it works now, great. Very unfortunate, but again, you know, unfortunately, Again, NMyGen is still under development, and there are still some crazy things you have to do to, to get it to work the way you think it should. Um, yeah, uh, I know. I'm not in, I, I am in a Git directory, um, but I'm not committing anything at this point. This is just, you know, stuff that I'm writing, and I, I can control Z as much as I like. Um, okay. So we've now checked that this reg32 with load actually works. So let's stick it in here, which is what I originally wanted to do. Okay, so first thing that I'm going to do, let me get rid of this line because I don't need that. That was just for illustrational purposes. Uh, maybe it makes sense that the clocks are explicit. Well, yeah. So again, there's this difference between the formal verification clock, which is the, the time step, which always ticks. And then there's an actual clock, which goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And the problem is that a formal verification clock is not exactly the same with a, with a regular signal clock. Sorry, coding. Yeah, okay, coding. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I don't know how professional streamers keep this straight. Okay, I'm not a professional streamer. Okay, so so this is the block of code that I want to convert. Okay, I'm going to convert one of these registers, just one. So so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to extract. that, right? This is the same logic. It's exactly the same logic. So now I'm going to say switch window on focus. Um, this is OBS, uh, and I can't do that on, in OBS. I have to actually switch the scene. Um, I could make one scene with all of the windows. Um, but unfortunately, OBS decides what window goes on top of what other window, so that's not going to work either. So, um, okay. So what I want to do is I want to say um, if self.chips, then do something else, do that. So, Um, so I start developing processor with making test benches. Uh, no, um, I actually have all the formal verification logic that I wrote after I developed the processor. Then I went back and forth between the code and the formal verification, back and forth, back and forth until everything worked. So, 
you should write a 74 series logic PNR backend. Somebody actually did that, except they used um, the individual gate packages, you know, the, the 1G packet, the 74 1G packages. Um, yeah, and it was pretty crazy. Uh, okay. I don't need these parentheses. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to set up a register with load. So I'm just going to call this reg um, r. I'll call it r because I don't know if I used reg before. It's a pretty common word. So r equals um, I see reg. Third, oh, I need to import this, don't I? First of all, let me get that set up. Okay. And from I see seven four one six three seven four import that thing. Okay. Okay. So that's my register that I set up, and I have to add it to my submodules. Plus equals R. So that's my R. Um, ooh, yeah. Ooh, ouch. Um, yeah, okay. So first, so I'm simulating RV behavior. Are you going to create RTL from it later? If so, what tool will you use? I'm I'm actually doing that right now. I'm oh RTL. Um, that's what nmygen does. It it converts it to uh, an intermediate level RTL, and then you can synthesize it in an FPGA. But I'm not doing this in an FPGA. I'm I'm actually making discrete logic, uh, and I have to do that manually. So um, okay. So combinatorically. I want self.state.mcause to equal the output of my register. Also combinatorically, I want my register's input to be equal to data z in. So I've hooked up the input and the output. I have that output enable which I always want to be enabled. Um, and then I've got the load signal. So the load signal is basically this logic here. So m.b.combinatorical r.load equals self.z to csr and, remember what I said about parentheses, self.csr num equals mcause. I think that's right. I think that's right. So I've got the input and the output, and I've got the output enable hardwired to zero, so it's always outputting, and I've got my load signal. Um, so that's what that is. There's a bit of a problem here. There is a bit of a problem here. Because I use, ah, uh, I'm going to get. I'm going to get driver driver conflicts because here what I'm doing is I'm assigning m cause in the combinatorial domain. It used to be that I was assigning m cause in the ph2 write domain. And unfortunately, there are other places that I write to it. Yeah. Um. Where do I write? I write to it here. I write to it here. Um, this is not as clean as I thought it was going to be. I, I thought that I could. All right. You know what I can do? Here's what I can do. I just thought of another place that I can do this. So forget about M cause. Let's take a look at mem address. This is the only place that I write mem address. Yeah, yeah. The re the reason that I ran into trouble is that um, I wrote the code so m cause is used during traps and you know exceptions and interrupts, and I got lazy when I did that and I stopped using multiplexers, um, and that's why I'm running into this trouble right now. 
But for something like mem address, if I search for this and I search for when it's it's equated, that's the only place. So, so this is a good place that I can use uh, the register. Was there a notice for today? Um, I sent it out this morning. Um, and if you're subscribed and get notifications, you should have gotten a notification. Um, so what I want here is, okay, let's do this. If chips, then do something, otherwise do this other thing. Okay, so first I'm going to need that that um, register with load. So R equals I C reg32 with load, um, and it's going to be clocked on m.d.ph1. Okay. Uh, add it to the submodules. Um, this could be for both FPGA and ASIC. Um, ASIC support is lagging behind. Um, I understand there, there's some active um, issues going on with ASICs, um, namely around the resetting of, of registers to random values, which FPGAs don't really do. Um, so really, and my gen is for FPGAs at this point. Um, I'm not really using it for FPGAs, but I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, okay. So what I want is combinatorically self.state.mem address is equal to the output of the register. And the register's output is always enabled. Now, what should the input be? So m.b.combinatorical plus equals. So we've got load. Load equals, well, it's going to be any one of these, right? So it's going to be equal to this or this or this. What keyboard do I have? DOS keyboard. Here, I'll show you. DOS keyboard. I like the clicky. Or this. I have, I have the feeling that I'm going down the wrong path. Because... I'm kind of getting distracted from what I actually wanted to do in this particular case, right? Because what this is, is a five input multiplexer, right? So what we're doing is we're deciding what to put in the mem address register. And it's going to be one of these four things, or it's going to be itself. So that's a five input multiplexer. What I wrote here is a two input multiplexer. That's not what I wanted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change is I'm going to with mux. I'm going to do this. So this is a 32 bit register that multiplexes any of its inputs or itself. So let me go to the drawing board and show you what I'm thinking of. OK, so remember I had this register. So now let me call it mem address. Right, and here's the output and here's the input. So the code is basically 
one, two, three, four, five with one of the inputs connected to the output. And these are those four conditions. And that is the clock. That's what I want to write. So let's do that. <clears throat> and, and what I want is to make it a little more general. So um, with cherry reds, are these cherry reds or cherry blues? Um, I forget. Um, so what I want is to, to basically make this some, you know, some number n so that I can, I can choose how many inputs I actually want. So um, yeah, this is not the clickiest uh, of, the, of the clicky keyboards. Um, there, this is like one step below. So OK, so let's go to coding. So what I want is something like this. OK, so I will need a clock, and I will also need an n that tells me how many inputs I want. Okay, self.clock equals clock. Self.d equals, so this is going to be an array of um, signal 32s for nothing in range n. Okay, self dot, um, I'm going to leave NOE out, right? I'm just going to hard code that to zero. The output is a signal 32. And here's what the logic is. The logic. M equals the module. Okay. So I'm going to need um, a single reg 32. So R equals IC reg 32. And it's going to use that clock domain. Sub modules plus equals R. Okay. So first of all, um, I'm going to hard code output enabled to zero. There is no output enable. Input. Just as a reminder to myself. OK, so. All right, so what I want to do, oh, and I need the individual select lines, of course. So um, negative select equals a signal of, uh, OK, here's what I'm doing, n minus 1. Oops, I hit the wrong key. The reason that I want n minus 1 selects and not n is because I'm actually going to have n selects. It's just that one of the selects is always going to be high or active when none of these are active. So what that looks like is this. So um, I'm going to make an intermediate signal called um, n select, just underscore n select, sort of like internal n select equals signal of I I can do this, length of self n, however much that is, plus 1 for the output. Okay, And uh, combinatorically, n cell of 1 to the end is equal to n cell. Okay? And n cell of 0 is equal to, now I need something that says n cell of 1 equals 0. 
And there we go. So if if none of those other um, how about I just do this? There. So if none of those other select line, mm, that's not right. That's not right because these are negative enables. Um, I think I can just do that. Oh, wait, I can just do this. Invert the select, right, okay, so basically, um, what is it complaining about now? It's self.ncell, self, okay, so, um, if, if any one of these are zero, if any one of these are zero, in other words, active, then the inverse will not be zero. If all of these are one, in other words, they're all inactive, then the inverse of that is gonna be zero. And in, if that is zero, then I want this negative select to also be zero. So I actually want this. <laughs> this is why I hate dealing with negative logic. Uh, shouldn't the n of the constructor be the number of external inputs? Yeah, yeah, it should. It totally should. That's right. That's how it works. Uh, and so equals, yeah, okay. <clears throat> right? Right. Okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the right way of doing it. Okay, so. So that's that takes care of the uh, the negative select, and boy do I hate dealing with negative signals. Okay, let's deal with the output. That's easy to do. So self dot q is just equal to the output of r. Okay, and now let's deal with the inputs. We can do this pretty. Pretty straightforward for i in range n. Now I have to be careful here because I've decided, ah, oh, you know what I can do? I can do this. There, there we go. So what this does is it takes all the bits of n cell and it puts it in my, my augmented version, but it only does it uh, up to the number of bits that are here. Wait, is that right? Uh, yeah, so like two, two, Right, yeah, so th at, at this point, the high bit of the internal signal is gonna be zero because, well, you know, that uh, this signal has one fewer bits. Um, and in Python, the array index of negative one means the last element. So the high bit of n cell is equal to this ridiculous expression. Okay, so what I can do is for i in range n, r dot d sub i equals self dot d sub i, m dot uh, r dot d sub negative one equals r dot q. Okay. Uh, and n is actually len of self dot number of select lines. Return m. Okay. So, um, so again, I'm using this register 32, which doesn't have a multiplexer on it. It doesn't have a load signal. It's just a plain old register 32, right? No load signal, but it's got this negative output enable. Couldn't you use one of your MUX ICs here? Why didn't I do that? <laughs> I was such an idiot. 
So gonna save N. <sighs> and I did before, didn't I? Oh my god. I see Reg 32 with Mox. I mean it says it right in the name. <laughs> Could you not load something new into the register by inhibiting the clock from reaching the register? Scroll back about an hour and a half or so and you'll you'll see why we don't do that. Okay. <clears throat> the short answer is it's not safe to do that. Um, you have to be really careful. And I don't feel like being really careful. I feel like doing it safely. So, Okay, um, so there's the multiplexer. It's gonna be N plus one. Um, the register's uh, output enable is always going to be zero. Um, did the multiplexer have also an output enable? It doesn't. Okay. So that's good. Um, okay, the negative select. So. So first of all, let me hook up the internal signal. So R dot uh, D is equal to the output of the multiplexer, mux dot Y. Okay. And uh, self dot Q is equal to the output of the register. So we got, so we have the inputs going to the multiplexer, the multiplexer going to the register, the register going to the output. Don't forget to add the mix. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So now, Let's set up the select signals in the multiplexer. So mux dot n select equals. So like before, we're going to do that, except now mux dot n select of the last one is equal to this crazy thing. I don't need any of that crap. So I've got the selectors set up. Okay. I've got the output. And now I just need to hook up the input. So that's where this comes in. For i in range of n, uh, m dot b dot combinatorical, mux dot a sub i is equal to self dot d sub i. Okay, I've hooked up the output. This is self dot n. I've hooked up the output. I've hooked up the input. How about we do some formal verification on this? That would be a good idea. Let's do that. Mux A of N is still missing. Uh, thank you. M.D.com mux A of negative one is equal to uh, the output of the register. Yeah, that's it, right? So if nothing is selected, then the output of the register is selected. <clears throat> And okay. So let's try this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's a 
two input multiplexer. I'm kind of assuming that if it works with, with two inputs, it's gonna work with you know, any number of inputs. So, uh, okay, so that's my S. So first of all, let me set up the signals that I want to take a look at. So it's gonna be D and cell and Q. D. Can I just do that? D and cell and Q. I don't think I need to add Q to here, but yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so negative output enable is always going to be there. There, so. Um, I don't need load. Okay, so <clears throat> what should happen if the clock rose? Okay, so if, let's just start with, um, let's just start with uh, s.n cell, oh yeah, I also wanna put a, a, an assumption here. Assume that s.n cell is not equal to zero. Right, because we don't want all of them to be enabled. We just want one of them to be enabled. So if the first one is enabled, then if the clock rose, then assert that the output is equal to the past value of the zeroth input. Right, and actually I can reverse this logic. So if the clock rose, then, um, hmm. Let's switch on s.n cell. For case zero, no, uh, that can't happen. So I'm just going to say m.d.com assert zero. It's not going to happen because we put this assumption over here. So if it's zero one, <clears throat> then we want then we want Q to be equal to the zeroth input. Otherwise, if it's one zero, then we want it equal to the oneth input. Otherwise, by default, we want it equal to Q. Let's just check that, right? Um, we, we can check um, we can check for fell later. I just want to make sure that this logic actually works. So let's try that. So I see reg thirty two. That goes down here. Okay, there's our logic. So we're making sure that when the clock rises, that the output gets lo that the output gets loaded with the previous value of whatever input is selected. Okay. Command line. Oh. Only signals may be added as ports. Okay, so apparently you can't just do S of D, because that's an array. You have to do this. Like I said, still under development, so maybe at some point it'll work, but. 
Okay, let's see. Do I get Fs or do I get GGs? I get Fs. <laughs> okay, 156. Well, that's wrong with 156. Oh. That's interesting. Uh, okay, let's take a look at uh, the trace. Let me just pull that up and then show it. Show it. Okay. So, what went wrong? What went wrong? So, here's the negative select. <clears throat> right, there's the 1, 1, which means that we want to retain the value. Here's our pH clock. So there's that thing. Oh, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on, passed. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me show that coding. That's what I forgot. Um, Right, because it's it's the value just before the positive edge that actually decides what gets loaded. Okay, all right, let's try that again. Command line. Okay, there's some more Fs. Uh, 154. All right, that didn't work. Let's see why. Top. Okay, so the clock, the selector. Okay, so the past is one zero. And that means that we should load sub one. So first of all, where is sub one? I don't see it in the trace. I guess I need to force it. Yeah, it is negative. It's negative selection. Can I get some Fs in the chat, please, for that? Can I please get some Fs in the chat? You know what? I'm going to make it easy on myself. They can't both be selected. There. Thanks to Sunip who, who noticed that. So he gets the GG. All right. Command line. Yay! All right. Formal verification for the win. And this is this is kind of you know the whole testing thing. Often you when you write your code and you test it sort of at the same time, you sort of go back and forth between your test and your code and your test and your code until you get it at least consistent and then you read your tests and you're like yeah that makes sense or yeah no that doesn't make sense so okay so that's great so all right we're almost done so we've got our 32-bit register with 32-bit multiplexing all right um so what we want to do is make this mux. So the output is going to be Q of the register. We don't have a negative output enable. Uh, let's set up our inputs first. So R dot uh, D sub zero equals that's going to be 0, 
R1 is this. R2 is that. Oh, yeah, sorry. My bad. Okay. So basically, I, I now have this multiplexer. Okay, and I'm just enumerating all of these things. R dot D sub three equals self dot mem data read. Now the controlling lines for each of these are positive. So R dot negative select of zero is equal to the negative of that. One, two, three. This, that, the other thing. And you know what? I'm going to interleave these. So that it's obvious what's going on. So, PC plus four, PC plus four to mem address. Data X in, X to mem address. Data Z in, Z to mem address. Mem data, mem data. Um, and then I need to import this dude. I like semicolons. Okay. Okay. All right, so maybe this will work. Um, what instructions, what instructions set up PC plus four? I know the branch instruction does because it will either branch between, it, it will either branch to the next instruction or it will branch to some other value that gets calculated, which would be on Z. Uh, why is there no load input? Uh, because it's always loading on the clock, every single clock. The clock is not gated, which means that if none of these get loaded, then the output gets loaded. So that's why. Okay, uh, let's try the branch instruction. Make branch BMC. Okay, so the only thing that can that can uh, get screwed up here is we've already formally verified the processor. We've already formally verified that multiplexing register. So the only thing that can possibly go wrong, the only thing that can possibly go wrong here is that I just screwed up that that sort of glue logic. So let's see what happens. Oops. Yeah, I need to specify n. Go back to coding. Uh, what's n here? It's four. There are four signals. Um, I'm going to make this like this. Clock equals n equals. I always hate to, to leave these bare variables because it doesn't really say what it is. Like, you know, if I do, you know, four comma true comma zero, I don't know by reading that what that means, um, you know, unless I have these neat little tool tips. But if I don't, you know, it would be nice to see immediately, you know, this is X, this is, you know, Y, this is Z. So that's why I kind of like using the, the, the keys in the arguments. Okay, command line. Let's take a look. Here we go. Here we go. We're compiling. We're verifying. We're chugging through the generated code right now. And we're gonna start any second now. Any second now. There we go. It's starting. Okay, here we go. Here we go. We're going. Okay. 
So this will probably take a, a minute or two to to uh, it doesn't it doesn't run through all the values. Um, in fact, if you look down in the description, if you look at the nmygen exercises, there's one exercise that shows that formal verification doesn't actually just run through all possible combinations. Um, there's one place where I think I have like a a 128 bit counter, and I formally verify that it actually counts up, no matter what the count is. Hey, it succeeded. Done! Done! Okay, I've got my multiplexing register. So that's really great. Um, and that is all that I wanted to accomplish uh, right now. I just wanted that one module that was a multiplexed register. Um, and I use that many times. Um, so uh, where did you set chips equal to true? I can show you that right now. Good on you for, for checking me. So in the formal verification, um, where I set up my module, there's where I set chips equal to true. So the sequencer card is set up with chips equal to true. There's the sequencer card. Um, there is the init and chips is set to true. So chips equals true. Oops, chips equals true. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so tomorrow I will do um, full cache um, and pipelining um, with 16 pipelines and um, it will be fully compatible with the Heartbleed exploit. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, so really, so so to get back to like the, the origins of this project, um, it was like two and a half years ago or, or so. Um, I was standing at, at the bus stop and I was thinking, you know, I ought to build a project. I ought to, you know, start a large project. And I had just gotten into Verilog and RISC-V. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, RISC-V is supposed to be reduced instruction set. It's, it's supposed to be really light on hardware. So how hard could it possibly be to build a RISC-V processor not on an FPGA? And that was the origin of the project, building a RISC-V processor not on an FPGA. Um, and uh, so I, I started on it and I did the wrong thing. I started with designing the circuitry instead of designing the logic. Um, so I started designing uh, what I thought would be the bus, play the jingle, I, I don't have that queued up, but you know, I'm building a RISC-V processor, not on an FPGA. So yeah, okay. Um, so I started designing the circuitry before I, I even designed the logic. Um, and I rapidly ran into like respins of PCBs and then this wouldn't work and then that wouldn't work. And then I was like, oh, I forgot. I need this extra signal and now my bus is incorrect because I already built the PCB for the bus. So I did it all wrong. Uh, and at that point, I just sort of gave up. And at that point, I didn't know anything about NMyGen. And I was like, you know what? This is way too large a project for me to do in Verilog because Verilog just seems very foreign to me and so does VHDL. And I don't want to use it anyway. So to hell with it. And I just gave up. That was two years ago. Um, and then I started learning NMyGen, and I was like, you know what, this is pretty fun, actually, you know, writing hardware in Python. Um, you know, and, and I, I interacted with the creator of, of NMyGen, and, you know, I, I started, you know, explaining what I was trying to do, and, you know, like, this example doesn't work, that example doesn't work, and then, you know, we, we would get it to where the example did work. Maybe it was a problem with my example, maybe it was a problem with NMyGen. Um, so anyway, you know, fast forward two years later, and I was like, you know what, I've done a couple of projects, large projects, with NMyGen. Um, I, I think I did a, um, a 6800 processor in it, um, and I was never really happy with it, but I did do formal verification with it. And I was like, you know what, I may as well just dust off the RISC-V uh, project. And uh, 
and here we are. So, you know, I started writing this something like three months ago, and um, at the point where I figured out that this was going to be a good thing, um, I, I started, you know, doing some YouTube videos, and that was about eight weeks ago. Um, so there's, there's seven episodes plus uh, one live stream before, which was yesterday, and one live stream now. Um, and that is where we are today. Now, you know, given all this, the question is, how big do I suspect the whole thing is going to end up being? And the answer to that is probably fairly big, but I'm willing to give it a shot. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll just see where this goes. I mean, it, it's going to be kind of interesting to see. Um, oh, yeah, and, and the other thing is that uh, the previous incarnation of the ALU uh, used the cadet model, which means can't add, doesn't even try. Um, this is a well-honored tradition in, uh, in computer design where you don't actually have any adders, you just have memory. So initially I used memory, and boy, did it turn out to be complex because... First of all, in order to be fast, I had to use RAMs, because ROMs are slow, um, unless they're mask ROMs, and of course I'm not going to create a mask ROM. So um, I, I wanted to use all static RAMs. Well, now you have to load the RAMs with something. So of course I had to have ROMs, and then I had to have a sequencer that would load the ROMs into the RAMs, then the ALU would work, and I thought, that's pretty cool. And then after I gave up, I, I thought, wow, that was a crap job that I did. Um, so instead, I'm just going to be using standard 4-bit ALUs, which exist, uh, the 74 181s and the 182 carry look-ahead units. So I'm going to be using those because they're fast enough. Okay, let's see what's in the chat uh, before I, I hang up the phone. Um, yeah, it's midnight here, but I got to catch this. Well, it's almost at the end, so um, you can go to sleep soon, I promise. Okay, uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Not Heartbleed, you were talking about Spectre. Yeah, probably Spectre. There was also, um, um, there were a couple of others that, 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 you know, that were thanks to predictive branching. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Yeah, generating KiCad schematics from NMyGen, that's a whole other project. Um, I have the feeling that it, that it could be done, but I'm not really sure how. So my thoughts on this is that YOSIS, um, which is which is what I use for formal verification and can also be used for uh, creating FPGAs, um, YOSIS has one stage called tech mapping. And with tech mapping, what you do is you um, basically have the modules that you know work in an FPGA and you map them onto, or rather you convert the uh, basic low-level uh, representation, which is RTL, um, in your design and you transform that into modules that the FPGA can use. And that whole process is called tech mapping. And I mentioned that somebody used 741G gates as a simple tech map, um, so that was uh, so that was something that could be done. So what you could do is you could say, you know, I've got a handful of these chips. I've got AND gates, I've got OR gates, I've got 16-bit buffers, I've got 16-bit registers. But the problem is, you have to write that middle level, middle layer. You have to write that layer that looks at the RTL and then groups them into these buffers and registers and basic gates and things like that. And that's just something that I have no idea how it works in Yosis. Um, so I don't even want to tackle that at this point. Um, but it's possible. Once you do that, then you could probably just write a py write some uh, a Python script to take the output of that and just connect it up in in KiCad because. You know, KiCad files are just text files, and they have a well-known format. So, um, yeah. Okay, let's see what's next. Um, 
Yeah, so that, that, that is the pattern recognition, is the tech mapping. Um, whatever happened with the 6809 I wrote in NMyGen, I just decided to say, well, I've learned all that I, that I need to. I, I don't really need to go any further with that. And that's a problem with me. Um, I, I tend to do that with projects. Um, I tend to like the planning stage and I like the learning stage, but I don't like the actual, okay, let's clean this up and, you know, make it nice and, you know, put it, you know, put it on a shelf. Um, you know, at that point, I, I've sort of learned everything I need to and, and I, I don't really need to continue with the project. So I just drop it. Um, yeah, layout help. Yeah, I mean, I mean, layout is is just a pain, and it would be nice to get some help, but you know, that's way down the line, way way down the line. Yeah, Zork misses me. Yeah, um, so Zork again suffered from the the premature um, pre, uh, premature steps in in projects. Um, I I went immediately from I have an idea to I'm going to implement it. And that was the wrong thing to do. Um, and of course, I didn't know in my gen at that time. Um, so, so maybe one day I will pick up the Zork thing again. Um, but I kind of have the feeling that I'm not going to because I'm going to look at the Zork instruction set and I'm going to say, no, no, I already did a risk processor and that has very few instructions. I'm not going to do another processor. So, yeah. Um... Okay, I think that's about it. Um, so the plan for the next few weeks is um, I'm probably just going to go off and replace whatever sections I can in the processor with these uh, multiplexed registers um, that I built. Uh, there's really no need for, for you to watch as I do that because you, you've watched it once and it's just going to be more of the same. Um, so there will come a time when I see something more interesting to do, uh, and then maybe I will live stream that, or maybe I'll just make another episode. So, um, I guess until then, thanks for watching. You people are the truly hardcore audience. Um, and I also really appreciate the people in the chat who noticed uh, right away problems with the code that I was writing. Um, and let me just switch to the main view. Um, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, that certainly saved me some time. So uh, good for you. Thank you very much to the chat. I love you guys very much. Um, you, you make me a lot happier than I would be just doing this alone sitting in my sitting in my little jumper here that's not a jumper is it um yeah uk slang um so thanks a lot thanks for the f's thanks for the ggs and uh thanks for watching catch you later bye